new is a little bit above budget for this part of the, uh, the so far in the year. Just keep in mind that the approved budget for this year included um, a significant contributions from our bank account, but we've had $3,600 about in revenue so far. And our expenses have been, if I scroll down here, only $635, $650. So we're ahead. The expenses have been all overhead related expenses that are that we usually have, like we had to pay for Zoom, we had to pay for the website, WordPress, we had to pay for PT board, uh, we had to pay our insurance, we have bank fees. So that's pretty much all we've done. And as of October 31st, we have $15,025 in the bank. So um, things are looking fine. Expenses that I expect to be coming up soon, uh, which will, uh, we have some teacher grants that have been awarded that'll go out soon. And we have some award expenses from last year that have to come out of this year because of the way we're a cash-based accounting um, that'll be coming up soon. But if there's any questions, uh, treasurer at fairfaxcountyscepta.org or try to find me on Facebook. And uh, we're also, since people can't walk up to me at a meeting and technically say, give me that piece of paper, I'm gonna see about uh, talking to our comms team about maybe getting these reports posted on our website. So any questions? I didn't think so. Okay, right. well, required to do that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Richard. If anyone has any questions, you can always feel free to uh, shoot us emails on this. I'm trying to screen share the agenda here, and I'm it, it vanished on me. I apologize for the the technical snafus this evening. Um, let's jump over to uh, Lauren McCaughey to fill us in on our exciting progress with our mini grants. All right, hi everyone. Uh, so tonight we uh, have some exciting news. We are going to announce the six winners of our first round of many grants this year. Uh, so first I just wanna say thank you to the members of our volunteer panel of judges. Uh, thank you to the SEPTA board and thank you to every member of SEPTA because it's our membership funds that enable these many grants to be possible. So without further ado, the fall 2020 many grant winners are Susan Hahn, of Great Falls Elementary School, Jamise Herring Barker of Hayfield Secondary School, Rebecca Moricki of Laurel Ridge Elementary Comprehensive Services Site, Philippa G. Van Gelder Hindman of Fairfax Villa Elementary School, Denise Strong of Cardinal Forest Elementary, and Samantha Vivian Beck at Twain Middle School. So a huge round of congratulations to those six individuals and to all of the other teachers and staff who submitted for this round and were not selected, we urge you to submit again. Uh, we'll have two further rounds and the next upcoming deadline will be February 1st. Excellent, you said just to reiterate that the next deadline is February 1st, correct? That's right. Okay, great. Um, next, I wanted, thank you very much and congratulations to everybody. We're really excited to give away money. Um, a friendly reminder that we are looking for liaisons to all of our schools. So if you are interested in representing SEPTA at your school, please email Kate, who is our liaison chair this year. And the address is um, sped, S-P-E-D, liaisons at fairfaxcountysepta.org. But really you can email any of us or just message us on Facebook and we will be more than happy to connect you with Kate to take care of that. Um, Ali, are you on yet? Let me see, do we have Ali in? I don't know if we do, sorry. Um, uh, Michelle, Ali yeah. is texting that she's having problems getting on. So I'm trying to send her the user the password the information okay if you want to just forward her oh. the same link yeah. that i forwarded you thank you we'll come back to her because that's always fun and exciting um and we are usually not this crazy with our organizational skills but we are looking for someone who has really great organizational skills to help us out with our annual awards ceremony um this role will involve soliciting um nominations for our annual awards and organizing uh, people who will be helping you out to, which we can help you find, um, people to help 
review the nominations and select the winners, and then putting together, again, with help, um, a presentation, which at this point is looking like it's going to be online as well. So if you have a knack for organizing things, we would love your help. We're happy to help with the tech part of it too. So feel free to reach out to us and let us know. Um, let me see, is Ali in or not yet? Not yet. Oh, wait, hold on. Here we go. Okay, Ali's coming in. While she's coming in, I wanted to also share about another really exciting thing that we're announcing later this week. Um, we have been hearing lots of stories from our special educators and our support staff um, about all the challenges and the exhaustion and the long hours that they're putting in, uh, both for the in person students and also for all their virtual work. And there's nothing that we would love to see more than our staff getting the same kind of love that a lot of our uh, first responders have been getting and so forth. So we're looking to kick off a staff appreciation campaign and it's going to be called Thankful Thursdays. And so keep your eyes on our Facebook page for whatever the thankful activity is going to be for the week. Um, but I would encourage you right off the bat to please, you know, shout out to your staff, send a quick email to their principal, send them a quick note to say thank you, put on your Facebook page how much you love your special ed teachers and instructional assistants and related service providers. Um, but we, we're really looking to, to help boost morale of our staff because things are, are exhausting um, for them right now, for sure. Allie, welcome. Are you ready to share with us about ACSD? I'm so sorry. I had the Facebook link and I couldn't find the Zoom link anywhere. I apologize. We're, we're but I'm so glad to join you. Tonight, so <laughs> go right ahead. It's fine. <laughs> Okay, hi everyone. So glad to see so many people attending the meeting um, and lots more on Facebook, I, as I saw while I was there. Um, hi, I'm Allie Baldessari. I'm SEPTA's representative on the Advisory Committee for Students with Disabilities, also called the ACSD, which is um, the Virginia Department of Education required advisory committee to our school board. Our basic purpose is to inform the FCPS school board on unmet needs of students with disabilities. There's more on the ACSD webpage, which will come up if you Google FCPS space ACSD. You will find meeting dates, agendas, and the minutes and recordings because they've all been virtual. So we recorded all those meetings of all past meetings. In recent meetings, we have been studying literacy intervention from identification with the iReady Universal Screener to FCPS's intervention programs. We've also been studying restraint and seclusion and making recommendations for new restraint and seclusion policies for 2021. Our next meeting, December 9th, will be live streamed like all of our virtual meetings. Public comment is welcome. See our webpage for more info. Thank you very much, Allie. Um, Allie has been a very vocal um, and very supportive voice for SEPTA in the ACSD. Um, we don't have an advocacy presentation tonight, but I did want to let you know that our advocacy chair is um, actually in the school board meeting this evening. Um, she and Amanda Campbell, who, uh, Diane is the advocacy chair. Diane and Amanda both submitted video testimony to the school board for their meeting that is today. Um, and so keep your eyes out. We are continuing to work with some of our teacher groups. Um, we are supporting the voice of parents. We like everybody want kids back in school, but want them back in when everything can be done safely. Um, so for sure, keep an eye out for all of our advocacy work with the school board that we're doing. We also have our next general membership meeting coming up on Tuesday, January 19th at seven o'clock. Um, we're taking a little breather from our workshops for the Thanksgiving and December holiday time. Um, and I think that we are all straightened out on our technical piece as well at this point. So for everybody who is watching on YouTube, um, who is not a member of SEPTA, we strongly encourage you to join our voice. Um, there's always power and strength in numbers. I'm delighted to say that we had our 200th member 
joined this week. Um, that's a new high for us in terms of membership numbers. So we're ecstatic about that. Um, and we do encourage people to please join our membership. Um, so you can go to uh, our SEPTA website, fairfaxcountyseptaorg And from there, there will be a link for you to join our organization. If you need financial support to join for dues, please don't let that get in the way. Um, reach out to us and we're happy to make accommodations for you by all means. Okay, I think that I got through all of the information that we needed to get through. And at this point, we should be ready for Dr. Varnia. And I just realized that in the midst of all the crazy, I think I closed your bio. So uh, I'm afraid I'm going to have to just have you, you tell us a little bit about yourself at this point. Sure. What, what I can tell you from memory is that uh, Rajnavarya is a co-founder of MindWell Psychology. Um, and yep, and I don't remember the rest <laughs> of it from the top of my head. But what I will say is that um, many years ago, I attended a workshop at a school where she was presenting the same topic that she's presenting tonight. And I thought to myself, this is a person who I would want to be evaluating my own kids um, because she explained assessments in the same way that I learned about it in a learning disabilities graduate program. And I said, you know, she makes it easy for parents to understand and, uh, I just think gets it right. So I'm delighted to welcome her to our meeting tonight. And I think I will just turn it over to you at this point. Okay, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so yes, my name is Raj Navaria. I'm a co-founder of Mindwell Psychology. And I've been a licensed clinical psychologist for almost 25 years. Um, for the past, gosh, almost 17, 18 years, I've really been focusing on neuropsychological or psychoeducational testing. And I have a specific interest in dyslexia, um, dyslexia and ADHD, but I, I tend to, if I can work with kids really young and I can find out if they have the dyslexia at age six or seven, that's just so good because dyslexia can be remediated. And so I wanna make sure that they're getting the intervention that they need. So tonight I'm gonna talk about um, psychoeducational testing in general. Um, I'm going to use those two terms, psychoeducational and neuropsychological, interchangeably. Um, for my purposes, they're, going to, they're the same term. So I'm going to share my screen. One second. Okay, so understanding psychoeducational testing. Oops, it is not moving. Hold on one second. There we go. Okay. So the point of getting psychoeducational testing is um, to really determine a diagnosis, importance of testing at an early stage to determine areas of strengths and areas of weakness, but it's never too late. At MindWell, we've tested um, people who are in their 50s, who are in their 60s, who are struggling with work. We test um, students who are in graduate school. We test students who are in college but it's wonderful when we can actually test kids in grade school because we can get them on the right path. So what is neuropsychological testing? A systematic study of major areas of cognitive and academic functioning, translation or knowing how you learn. It establishes a profile of personal strengths and weaknesses or information about maximizing strengths and accommodating or remediating weaknesses and it allows us to make inferences about a person's brain function or determining if you have a learning disability, which is something you'd wanna know. Okay, so facts about learning disabilities. 15% of the US population or one in seven Americans has some type of learning disability. And as many as 80% of students with learning disabilities have reading problems. So that's why um, you'll see a lot of psychoeducational testing tends to focus on reading, and we'll talk about that further in the talk. Attention disorders such as ADHD and learning disabilities often occur at the same time, but the two disorders are not the same. And between 30 and 
percent of children with learning disabilities will also have ADHD. The reverse is also true. Between 30 and 50% of children with ADHD will also have a learning disability. So it's wise to look for both possibilities. I'm pressing return and it's not going to the next page. Hold on a second. There we go. So the first area, there are a lot of different areas that we're going to assess. Tonight, we're going to talk about cognitive ability, memory, executive functioning, um, the auditory route to reading, the visual route to reading. We're going to talk about reading, writing, and math, and how we have to map out all of those different areas to figure out how a child learns. Okay, so the first area of cognitive ability is something called verbal comprehension. We also assess for nonverbal reasoning and visual spatial skills. Now, what does verbal comprehension mean? Basically, we're testing the child's vocabulary. And this isn't if they just know the word in context. We're looking to see if they can be precise and if they can be elaborate, if they can elaborate on the definition. Um, we also test abstraction. So it starts pretty easy. We might ask, how are red and blue alike? but it gets more and more abstract and we're really testing to see if the child can use language at a critical thinking level. We also test for nonverbal reasoning, which is using deductive and quantitative logic. So we give the student patterns to figure out, we give them ratios to figure out. There's no language involved in these tasks. So we're really testing their nonverbal reasoning. And then visual spatial skills is the third sort of heavy hitter of cognitive ability, also known as IQ. But IQ isn't just one thing. IQ includes verbal comprehension, nonverbal reasoning, visual spatial skills. It also actually includes working memory and processing speed. But with visual spatial skills, we're testing their whole part relationships. We give them puzzles to figure out, um, they have to manipulate figures in their mind, to have to rotate figures. So these three areas give us an idea of the problem solving skills of the student, how they think about things, how they approach tasks. So that's sort of the foundation of psychoeducational testing. We also test executive functioning. Now there are two areas of executive functioning, cognitive regulation and behavioral regulation. So let's talk about cognitive regulation first. Um, we're gonna test for attention. Uh, that comes up a lot. Uh, parents will report that the child can focus on something they're interested in, but if it's low interest, if it's tedious, if it's challenging, sometimes focus right, might really be a challenge. Um, we're also looking at the child's ability to initiate, to get started on a task, to shift, to be able to move fluidly from one task to another. Um, also looking at organization and planning. We look at working memory, which is, can you hold information in your mind for three to five seconds, which is basically another word for attention. And we look at task monitoring, being able to monitor one's own performance, being aware of time management. So we assess this in three main ways. Um, something called a continuous performance task. It's a test that we do on the computer. It's a boring test, but we wanna see the child can pay attention even when they're bored. And it measures reaction time, it measures impulsivity, it measures attention, it measures their ability to be vigilant during a task. Um, we also give questionnaires to the parents, to the teachers. If the child is old enough, we also ask them to fill out questionnaires, sort of measuring their own working memory, initiation, shifting. And there are also um, structured tasks of executive functioning that we can give. One of the most popular ones is called the Dallas Kaplan, where we're testing ability for fluency, to shift between tasks, and to do two things at once. Now, the other part of executive functioning is behavioral regulation. So there's self-monitoring, noticing how your behavior affects others. Um, this also includes hyperactivity, feeling restless, on the go, feeling like you have a motor. Um, also inhibition, being able to pause or react or stop before an action. Um, mostly, this is 
um, assessed through questionnaires, so through parent and teacher report. Okay, so why is attention so important in learning? Because attention is the first part of the learning process. First, you attend to something that you see or something that you hear, and then you encode it. You make it meaningful in your mind. You store it, and then there's recall. Recall whether it's for a test, homework, or a dinner discussion. But if the attention phase is short-circuited, the student is not paying attention in the first place, the entire learning process can be short-circuited. So that's why we really want to focus on is attention at its optimal level? So ADHD. For kids, when there's a low interest task, or it might be tedious, or it might be challenging, they actually, their energy level decreases. So we try to conceptualize ADHD almost more as a disorder of arousal than attention. So when people without ADHD have to do something they don't wanna do, they sort of gear up and get it done. For someone with ADHD, the energy level drops. And then they might avoid, they might procrastinate, forget, they might get distracted, and the task isn't completed. And this can often result in feeling anxious. So a common um, vicious cycle I see is students getting distracted by non-essential details or overthinking. That contributes to a lack of focus. Then their efficiency decreases for whatever task they're trying to do. They get more distracted and they feel more anxious. Once they feel more anxious, that makes them, makes them get more distracted. So then we're in a vicious loop. Okay, so executive functioning. Remember, ADHD is not just an attention disorder. It's a highly genetic medical disorder affecting an array of abilities related to executive functioning, including regulation, organization, planning, and forethought. And it's often referred to as our brand manager. Um, ADHD can affect um, attention, behavior, projects, a time management, sustaining routines, goals, emotions, and more. So any psychoeducational or neuropsychological evaluation evaluation should include executive functioning. Excuse me. Okay, another um, very important area to assess is memory. And there are three types of memory. Working memory, as I mentioned before, is three to five seconds. So how I might assess for this is I might say some numbers and ask the student to say it backwards. Then I might say some more numbers and ask the student to say them in forward order or in numerical order. So I'm seeing if they can attend to what I'm saying in that moment. Now with short-term memory, we're assessing verbal and visual memory. So I might tell them a story, see how much they remember. I might give, give them a list of words to remember. I might show them photographs. I might show them a design they have to remember. So it's nice to know both auditory memory and visual memory. And we can find out if kids are more visual learners or verbal learners. And then we test for long-term memory, which is actually only about 30 minutes post presenting the information. Um, but we're really seeing that the student has encoded the material that they saw or that they heard, if they've stored it, and if they can recall it spontaneously. So another important area of neuropsychological testing. Okay, so this is where I think it gets really interesting and really important. Um, reading, obviously, is a cornerstone of, of any type of learning. And there's an auditory route to reading, which includes three different areas, phonological awareness, rapid naming, and auditory working memory. So let's start with phonological awareness. An individual's awareness of and access to the sound structure of his or her oral language. So what you might see in the classroom with someone who has phonological issues is word finding issues or word retrieval issues. They may substitute words. Um, I just had a student that I tested recently who called an I, what was it? They called a calculator, a carburetor. Um, problems with rhyming, not recognizing beginning and ending sounds. 
And so this impacts decoding, reading, decoding, being able to pronounce a word, decipher a word, and it often impacts spelling. So a very um, common test that we give for this is called the Comprehensive Test of Phonological Processing, second edition, it's called the CTOP. And we ask the child to blend words, blend sounds, segment sounds, identify beginning sounds, ending sounds. So for example, it starts very easy. Say popcorn, but don't say pop. Can they recognize that corn is left? But then it gets pretty tough. Um, we might say, say winter, but don't say t. Well, they know that winner is left. A lot of dyslexic students think that it's just win that is left because they can't take the ending sound to the beginning sound and match them together. So phonological awareness is an essential area of psychoeducational testing. As is rapid naming, the speed at which you can retrieve labels to symbols, colors, letters, and numbers. So we're just asking the child to uh, name letters as fast as they can, name numbers as fast as they can. And the reason why this is important is because we wanna see if it's automatic. The goal isn't to be fast for fast sake, but can it be automatic so that you have room for comprehension? Oftentimes when we see issues with rapid naming, we have students have difficulty with naming colors, days of the week, months of the year at a younger age. Um, the alphabet is not automatic, difficulty with skip counting. But when rapid naming is um, slow, it often impacts reading fluency. So again, because the reading isn't automatic, there's not enough energy left over for comprehension. Third area we assess is called auditory working memory. This is ordering and sequencing heard information into meaningful chunks. What you might see in the classroom, students might lack a sense of time. There might be note taking challenges. So the teacher is giving a lecture, but the student is having trouble keeping up with what is being said. There might also be challenges with following multi-step directions. Um, when we see weaknesses in auditory working memory, it often impacts spelling, ordering of letters and words, and general decoding. But there is also a visual route to reading, which often goes, people don't recognize this as much, and I think this is very important to assess. Orthographic awareness, visual discrimination, and visual motor skills. So let's start with visual and motor processing. The ability to coordinate what one sees to a motor response to reproduce something that he or she sees using a pencil and paper. So we give the student a copying task. They have to copy figures that have angles, overlaps, three-dimensionality. And we're really looking if they can understand the whole and the part and coordinate what they see to a motor response. So what you might often see in the classroom with someone who has a visual motor issue is sluggish handwriting or handwriting that's not on one plane. Um, difficulty copying from board or book. So information is presented on the blackboard or the whiteboard and it's either taking them a longer amount of time to copy it down or they're copying it down incorrectly. And then also just dumbing down written work um, that they can express themselves verbally quite well but the actual act of writing is so laborious that um, what they might be able to say verbally becomes very simplistic when they try to write it. So an impact on written organization and spelling. Visual discrimination, using the sense of sight to notice and compare the features of different items to distinguish one item from another. So what you might see in the classroom, misunderstanding or confusing written symbols. So um, again, I just tested someone recently who subtracted everything that he was supposed to add. He was messing up the plus and the minus sign. BD reversals, PQ reversals, six nine reversals, two five reversals. So this is going to impact just sort of very pragmatically being able to decipher a worksheet. Um, 
I am a big fan of me measuring orthographic awareness. Make sure that if you get testing done, the evaluator assesses for orthographic awareness. Um, this is the ability to decode words by how the letters, so sorry, the ability to decode word, words by how the letters sound is the phonological process and the ability to decode them by how the letters in the words are placed is the orthographic process. Um, so you're looking at letter sequences and you're looking at spatial position patterns in words. Now to be clear, this is not a vision issue. We're not testing vision. We're not testing their eyesight. We're seeing if their brain can process common digraphs like TH, um, common vowel digraphs, um, common sequences, bridge vowels. And so by noticing where the letters are in the word, they can decode the word. Um, a test that I usually give to measure orthographic awareness is called the test of um, orthographic competence, the TOC, the talk. Okay, so we talked about memory, we talked about executive functioning, we talked about cognitive ability, we talked about the visual route to reading, the auditory route to reading. So now let's actually get to reading. In a neuropsychological examination, we are going to be measuring phonemic decoding, timed and untimed. Now phonemic decoding is basically we're asking the student to read nonsense words and we're giving them nonsense words because we wanna make sure they haven't memorized the word. Now, the reason I always give timed and untimed is there are a lot of students who can actually laboriously figure out a word but the, and they get credit for it, but it's not automatic. So we wanna see, can they decode a nonsense word automatically? We're gonna also look at the orthographic decoding. We're gonna look at the reading comprehension and this should usually done, be done with both silent reading comprehension and oral reading comprehension. Um, the oral reading is so important because this is where I get to see the students' errors. If they're making errors in accuracy, if they're inserting words, if they're deleting words, if they're making up new words based on the first couple letters of the word, I want to see the quality of their reading. And then we're also measuring reading fluency. Again, the goal isn't to be fast for fast sake, but to be automatic. So here we often give silent, um, simple sentences and they have to answer if they're true or false. Um, we might also measure their oral reading. Um, two major tests that we give for reading is the Woodcock-Johnson fourth edition and the Wexler individual achievement test. It's actually now on its fourth edition as well. The gray oral reading test is a great measure to look at um, accuracy, fluency, and comprehension. Okay, so then we also wanna look at writing. We're gonna look at spelling, both recognition and production. So I find it really interesting to see if the child can recognize acknowledged spelling. So on the talk that I mentioned before, the test of orthographic competence, it gives different homonyms and the student has to identify based on the picture the correct spelling of the word. So can they recognize what good spelling looks like? Then we also ask them to obviously spell real words. We ask them to write sentences, both combining and building sentences. So a lot of times children with dysgraphia, which is a disorder of written expression, have problems combining two sentences into one more precise sentence. Then we're also looking at them building a sentence based on a target word. And then for nine and up, ages nine and up, we're looking for them to compose a paragraph. So we ask them to write a story. And here we're measuring contextual conventions, we're measuring their story construction skills, things like capitalization, punctuation, are they using introductory clauses? Are they using conversation? Um, is there a sequence to their story? And these are all based on age or grade-based norms. Um, math, we're gonna measure calculation, both 
timed and untimed, but without a calculator. I get asked that a lot. Can I use my calculator? No. We want to see if you can know those basic operations of manipulating fractions, long division, percentages, exponents, multiplication, regrouping. But we also look at math fluency, just math facts, addition, subtraction, and multiplication. We'll time them on these tasks. And then a pride plot problem. So we're giving them word problems. Usually the problems are read to them because we don't want the reading to be an interference um, issue. So we'll read them the problem. They're looking at it, but we want to see if they can use math reasoning to determine the right operation to use to solve the problem. Okay, so when an assessor works with a student, it's usually for several hours with breaks. There's lots of different tasks and each task is only about five or 10 minutes. So there's so much variety and it's not the student just sitting there filling out a Scantron sheet. It's a conversation between the examiner and the student because how they approach the task is sometimes just as important as the answer. So I want to know if something was boring, if something was interesting, if something was challenging. I'm also making observations. So while I'm giving them a list of numbers to remember, I want to see, are they having difficulty because of attention? Are they having difficulty because of anxiety? Are they having difficulty because of auditory processing? Are they having difficulty because they're uncomfortable with, with numbers? So the examiner, examinee relationship is so important. And um, this is just why I feel really strongly that it should always, the testing should always be done by a psychologist and um, not a student. I think the actual interaction of watching, observing, experiencing the assessment is so important. So we get a constellation of scores, everything that I just talked about, memory, executive functioning, processing. Scores are based on what we call standard scores, where a score of 100 is average. Scores between 90 and 109 are in the average range. Now we're comparing the student either to other students exactly their age. So it might be someone 11 years, eight months. Those are different norms than for someone who's 11 years, four months, because we're expecting more or less based on the age. We might also be comparing them to the grade level. So we're getting information based on a national sample if their scores are in the average range, below average, very low, extremely low, or on the other end, if they're above average, very high, extremely high. No student has all average scores. No student has all extremely high scores. Um, it's the constellation of scores that's so important to understand. Why is one score high? Why is one score low? What's causing that relative weakness? And what can we do about it? So like I mentioned before, this is, met, this is based on a bell curve where 100 is average. Um, scores between the 25th and 75th percentile are average. And I know 25 sounds low. We're not talking about 25%. We're talking about 25th percentile in terms of also comparing them to other kids their age. So scores between 25 and 75th percentile are average. Um, scores below 25 are below average and scores above 75 are above average. So let me just show you a case example. This, remember 100 is average. Let's say I do a verbal IQ test and I find out their verbal IQ is 115. So above average verbal comprehension. They are, can use language very well. They're able to express themselves. I find out that their visual memory is at a 121, which is actually in the very high range. So when I show them information, they're able to encode it, store it, and recall. So, so far, everything that we're assessing is looking really strong. Another area that I might assess is their sight word recognition. So these are real words. I'm looking to see, can they um, sort of quickly and automatically 
name, decode, say real words. And they can, they have a standard score of 103. So still in the average range. But now we're getting a low score. Phonemic decoding, standard score 83. So this is in the below average range. Now remember phonemic decoding is we're having the student decode nonsense words. Because again, we wanna make sure they haven't memorized the word. Do they know the rules of the English language to know when a G makes the hard G sound, when the G makes the soft G sound, um, when a C makes the K sound versus the S sound? There are actually rules for almost every word in the English language, as quirky as English is. Do they know these rules? Now, four out of five students tend to pick up on these rules automatically. One out of five need to be taught these rules explicitly. So the research is showing that one out of five students might have some form or some level of dyslexia. Now that might vary from mild, moderate to severe, but the intervention is the same. They need to be taught the rules, the phonics, usually in a multi-sensory manner, where they have to hear it, they have to see it, they might have to feel it, they might need to know where their tongue is in their mouth when they say the word, but they need to know the rules of the English language. So, so far with this student, we have someone who has a strong verbal IQ, strong visual memory, they can read real words, but given an unfamiliar word, they're not sure what to do with it. Another area that might be assessed is their phonological awareness. And again, this is sort of the auditory route to reading. Um, do, are they understanding the blends of words, how to segment a word, the beginning, middle, and ending sounds? Now, interestingly, their phonological awareness and the phonemic decoding was both below average, which is a common pattern that we see. Phonological awareness often predicts phonemic decoding. And a very low score, phonemic decoding efficiency, standard score 68. So with phonemic decoding at standard score 83, I was measuring um, could they decode nonsense words in an untimed situation? Then I'm asking them to decode nonsense words in a time situation. And for someone who's dyslexic, this is very, very challenging. And how this translates into the real word, world is that when they're given a word that they don't know, an unfamiliar word, they don't know what to do with it. Um, I find out their reading comprehension is at a 90, so that's actually in the average range. They're probably using their strong verbal IQ to compensate, but oftentimes there's only so long you can compensate. When kids get to the high school level and they're asked to read very complicated text, we want to make sure they're able to decipher every word in that text. And then I asked them to write single sentences. That's at a 109, so in the average range. And their spelling, though, is very low at a standard score of 79. So this student has both dyslexia, issues with decoding words, and dysgraphia, issues with spelling words as well. And then contextual conventions. I asked them to write a story their ability to use um, conversation, introductory clauses um, is below average. So I'm using this as an example to show you that it's a constellation of scores. There's no one ADHD test. There's no dyslexia test. Um, there are usually about 30 different subtests that we administer from about seven to 15 different tests. Um, so to review, neuropsychological testing can help with identifying learning disabilities because we're finding out what the weakness is, what the processing issue is that's causing the educational impact in reading, writing, or math. Is it a memory issue? Is it a processing issue? Is it a cognitive issue? Is it an executive functioning issue? Again, we're trying to figure out how you learn. So 
for any student. This is just such helpful information because like I said, no one has all average scores or above average scores. We want to find out the child's unique constellation of scores. Are they more of a verbal learner? Are they more of an auditory learner? Are they a visual learner? Do they need context? Do they do better with repetition? Um, we want to find out how the child learns. And then it provides recommendations for maximizing um, strengths and remediating weaknesses. So any good neuropsychological assessment will provide recommendations for both what should happen at school, what should happen at home, and basically three different areas, remediation, accommodation, and modification. So um, an accommodation might be something like extended time or a modification might be that the child is allowed to type instead of handwrite. Remediation is um, an actual program, like an Orton-Gillingham program to remediate dyslexia. So that's a specific program that's multi-century, empirically validated program to treat reading issues. So again, to provide recommendations for accommodation and remediation. All right, folks, so that's what I have. If you see any red flags, don't wait. Early intervention is the key to remediation, and that's really the key. But again, it's never too late. Thank you so much. Thank you. I always get something new out of your presentations. So you know, once again, uh, fantastic, thank you. We do have some questions that have come in. So I'm just gonna start to throw them at you if that's all right. Sure. Um, first one, what of, if any of these assessments are normed or accessible for students with complex communication needs? Uh, so, that's, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, almost everything I talked about is not normed for kids with complex communication needs. We'd have to give a test of nonverbal intelligence. So the most um, the most used one is called the C Tony, the comprehensive test of nonverbal intelligence. So when someone is challenged with language, um, then we want to see we want to really look at their nonverbal reasoning. And. Um, is that test more of an intelligence rather it than is. an achievement? It is. It's, it's looking at cognitive ability. Now, with the you know with the writing, it depends on what the communication disorder is. But um, the oral reading would probably be difficult. So then we'd be looking at comprehension more with silent comprehension. A common test for that is the gray silent reading test. Um, but again, it depends on that specific child and exactly what disability they have. Um, sorry, I want to make sure that I have everything here. Michelle, quick ask, yep. can you put the gallery mode back on? I can try. Did I just do it now? Yes, you did. Thank you. Okay, good. Technology. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me just copy over one more question here to keep on my list so I don't lose it. Um, okay, if private testing was done, and again, some of these questions um, may not relate directly to your work um, as a private evaluator. Um, so some of them we may need to sort of feel out together. Um, if private testing was done, for example, confirming ADHD or another uh, LD diagnosis outside in the, the assessment was done outside the school setting, does the school also conduct its own assessment in school? Um, I believe the answer to that is yes, that they will. You know, it's, it's usually yes, it depends on the school. So some schools will say, we're gonna take the testing from the evaluator and do behavioral observations to sort of confirm the results. Um, other schools will say, no, we need to replicate the results that the tester did, but they're not gonna do the full evaluation. They might do some targeted subtests. 
And then sort of the third tier level is they'll say, yes, we need to do the full testing. Um, my experience has been if a child already has an IEP, then they usually will use my testing without having to do additional testing. But if it's their first time getting an IEP, then the, they usually also want to conduct the school testing. Something that, that I've also um, come across is families who are doing private testing at the same time that the school is doing their assessment. And something I always encourage parents to do is make sure that those assessors are communicating with each other. Because 100% if- because a test can't be repeated. We can't both do the same tests within the same year. So it's very important that we know what testing the school is doing and vice versa. So nothing is getting repeated, repeated which would then invalidate the results. Absolutely. Uh, let's see. What kind of language um, do you recommend parents use with their kids to describe what's going to be happening as an, at an assessment? Um, I typically use language like, you're going to be going to do some activities. I don't use the word testing because kids get anxious right. about testing. What language do you recommend parents use to describe what's gonna happen? I often tell parents to tell them it's like working with a teacher. It's gonna remind them of school, that they're gonna be doing puzzles, patterns, some memory things, some word games, some things on the computer. And it's really to find out how their brain learns, how they think about things. Um, and I always say the point is not to get everything right. If they got everything right, that'd be sort of weird. So that's not the point. The point is to figure out how they approach a task um, and just to find out sort of what comes easier for them, what comes harder. And if we find out what comes harder, we'll know how to make that easier for them. And I, I love using that language of uh, what's easy for you and what's hard for you, because we all have things that are easy for us and hard for us. And that puts the whole strengths and weaknesses into a very kid-friendly framework. Uh, another question that came in, um, we've been approved for an IEE, um, an independent educational evaluation, which just for everybody to know is your right as a parent, one of your special education rights. If you disagree with the assessment that's been done in school, you can make a request to the Office of Due Process that you would like an IEE, which is an independent educational evaluation done at school system expense, where you take your child to an outside provider to have another evaluation done. So the question is, uh, we've been approved for an IEE. I suspect dyslexia and I already have confirmed ADHD. Do you have recommendations on doing the IEE now or waiting until we can get back to school? Oh, get get the IEE done now. Um, The sooner you get information, the better. I know it's so challenging with the virtual learning, um, but you wanna know if it is dyslexia, what processing issue is causing the dyslexia And then, um, you know, you want to see what the school can obviously do in terms of accommodations, modifications, but then also what you might be able to do at home um, for the remediation. So the sooner, the better. I would completely agree with you on that. Um, Let's see. Michelle? Uh, Yes. I actually have a question that has come in from our Facebook page. Okay. Um, regarding our, what is the difference between a psychoeducational testing and neuropsych testing? Oh, that's, uh, that's how I started the talk. So I use those terms interchangeably. Neuropsychological testing is measuring different type of brain functioning, memory, executive functioning. Um, psychoeducational testing tends to emphasize a little bit more of the educational impact. So in my training, when I was trained with neuropsychology, it was mostly working with adults who might have brain disorders like dementia or traumatic brain injury. Now I tend to use the term psychoeducational because I'm still measuring memory, executive functioning, cognitive ability, but I wanna see the impact on reading, writing, and math. And sometimes neuropsych testing does not, not always, but doesn't always um, 
look at the educational impact. Thank you. That is something that I'm asked frequently as well. Uh, let's see, while we're on the topic of, of IEEs, um, are, do you do evaluations for IEEs? Yep, all the time. So actually for Fairfax County, Loudoun, Prince William, Alexandria City, Fauquier, for all the counties in the area. And I like doing them because I like giving parents a second opinion. It's a second opinion on what's going on with, with their child. Um, and the testing when it's done privately just tends to look at the subtleties a little bit more. Um, and also, like I said, it's not a student doing the evaluation, it's myself. And I just feel like my behavioral observations are just so important. And um, another insider tip for our parents, when you do request from due process a um, IEE, they will give you a list of providers who have already been approved. It is not a complete list of providers. And you, if you so desire, can call other providers, um, such as Dr. Varia, who are not on the list and ask if they are under contract with the school system to do an IEE. If they're not, you can actually get the information of what it entails to them and they can decide if that's something they want to do or not. Um, but know that that list I give you is not the final it's not list. A, no, that's right. You can go to any licensed clinical psychologist. Yep. That's your prerogative. And speaking of IEEs, if you request an IEE, a uh, question that came in, are you required to provide the results to the school district before providing them to the parents? Uh, Fairfax County is very strict about that. Um, so what we've been doing is we mail the report, the final report to this, the eligibility um, team um, and or to the Office of Special Education, but I will give an oral debriefing in person. So now this is before COVID, but they, the parents would come in, I'd have the report in hand, I would go, I'll go through the report step by step. Usually the debriefing is about 90 minutes, but I can't give them a copy of the report until the school sends them the report. But I will make sure that they know all the results of the testing through an oral feedback. And that sounds like that's the rule from FCPS. It's FCPS, it's not for other counties. So it, it is specific to FCPS. Okay, and I don't think that there's federal guidelines on that. I don't think that's violating no, any kind of federal it's, rule. Yeah, I, yeah. That's, it's been frustrating. Yes, for sure, I, I can imagine. <laughs> Especially when parents are sitting there trying to absorb all this information. Um, let's see, we have several other questions. How do you track in school um, a child's phonemic awareness and writing development? So the kid's been diagnosed with dyslexia, for example. How, how do you track the, the progress that they're making with their remediation? So I probably can't speak too much to this because this would be the, the teacher or the academic therapist who's actually assessing that information but they would be looking at accuracy errors. They'd be looking at percentage of words correct and incorrect. They'd be looking at to see if comprehension was going up. Um, but when I'm doing the assessment, I'm doing sort of a snapshot in time. I'm not sort of reviewing um, their improvement. Uh, sorry, bear with me for just a moment here. I'm trying to keep things in a logical order for us. So um, if you have a child who is uh, recommended for getting remediation for their dyslexia, for example, how frequently and, and what uh, length of time would you say sessions should be held? So the research currently shows um, if it's a significant dyslexia, intervention should be four to five times a week 60 to 90 minutes at a time. And I know that sounds like a lot, but basically we're retraining the brain to figure out another way to decode those words. Um, it completely depends on the child, how, how many years that might take. 
It might take six months, it might take three years. Um, it also depends on the age of the child. It depends on how severe the dyslexia is. It also depends on if there are other comorbid issues like ADHD, um, but four to five times a week, 60 to 90 minutes. I actually want to um, go back to the IEE question for a moment. Um, if there are no uh, state or federal regulations saying that the school system has to see the results before the evaluator, um, then what is the consequence of you giving parents a copy of those results? Um, they won't pay me. That's a big consequence. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've gotten calls from, because what I used to just give it to the parents and I've gotten very, I've gotten scolding calls just saying, you're not allowed to do that. We've tried to figure out sort of where does it say that you're not allowed to do that? We haven't figured that out, but we get calls from the director of special education um, just saying we won't accept any more evaluations from MindWell if you continue to do that. I am not an attorney, nor do I pretend to be one, but that sounds awfully fishy awful. to me. I know. <laughs> All right, back to our questions here. Um, could you explain a little bit, uh, at least using this language, the discrepancy model, um, the discrepancy between um, potential and achievement um, between ability and, and what students produce. Yeah, so usually when they talk about the discrepancy model, they're talking about cognitive ability. So that's IQ. Remember, that's not just one single term, but looking at problem solving skills, verbal skills, reasoning skills, the discrepancy between that and academic achievement. So what the student is producing in terms of their reading comprehension, their reading decoding, um, generally the discrepancy model is based on one standard deviation. So I was telling you about the bell curve, 100 is average. So let's say we find out that um, a child's IQ is 100, but their reading is at an 85, um, 15 points below what might be predicted based on their ability. Um, as a psychologist, I definitely take in the discrepancy, but I don't only rely on the discrepancy model. I think that qualitatively, it's really important to find out what type of errors they're making. Um, it might be you know, less than 15 points and they might still have a learning disability. So we, we have uh, somebody who commented that um, their, your child was denied an IEP actually based on testing um, done at MindWell not because of the quality of the testing, but because um, they were told there were no peaks and valleys. And this is tough. This is really tough because when I'm assessing, I'm trying to find out at a pure level, are they struggling with learning? But the school does have certain guidelines. And so if you're not failing two years behind, if your valley isn't low enough, then you're not gonna get services. And does that mean your child doesn't have a learning disability? No, but does that mean that school doesn't have to provide services? Yes, so it's, that's where it's, it's very challenging. Absolutely, and, and I also remember learning that it would drive me crazy is that those uh, discrepancies vary from state to state. So some states or school systems might use two standard deviations, some might use one and a half, um, so you can qualify for a learning disability in one state and not another, or one school right. system and not another, which is a whole other story together. All right, let's see, another question. Um, if testing was done with a speech pathologist recently, would you review that testing? Um, would you review before further testing? Uh, I think this is asking about the, the repetition of, of assessments and tests. Yeah, because there's some overlap between what psychologists and SLPs do. So um, the uh, speech language pathologists might give the CTOP, for example, mm -hmm. the comprehensive test of phonological processing. Now, they're not going to give any IQ testing. They're probably not going to give any executive functioning testing. They're going to give language testing. So we would definitely want to review that. 
Absolutely so. There's a, a lot of overlap between speech and language disorders and learning disabilities. That, the, right. that language piece is, is a big overlap and a, a good speech evaluation can probably be an asset to you when you're looking. Absolutely. Well. Um, somebody asked if I called your office and requested to work with you as opposed to one of your colleagues, would that be considered? Um, yeah. I tried before COVID, I was told you were not available for our uh, No, I mean, it's it, it's a matter of timing. Unfortunately, you, you might have to wait a little longer. I'm not a big fan of parents having to wait. So I'd rather you, I'd rather you work with one of my colleagues who might be able to get you in sooner. But if there's a strong preference, then yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, is it important for you um, as doing the evaluation to observe the child in the classroom setting, obviously pre-COVID because now is just completely different. Yeah, my what I, I generally will observe preschool students um, once they're in grade school, um, obviously not in middle school, high school. Um, I, I don't do classroom observations. I will sometimes you know, call the teacher, have the teacher fill out questionnaires, um, you know, do an interview with the teacher. And that, that is a negative of private testing that you're not getting the classroom behavior observation, which I think is, is very important. Um, I wanna go back because we got a little clarification here about, um, I think this is the person who asked about the testing that didn't have peaks and valleys. Hopefully I'm not mixing up our different questions. Uh, but they mentioned that the testing did show that they were two years behind. So they're wondering about recommendations on where to go from here. Um, private intervention. So if this was an issue for reading disorder, working with a tutor or academic therapist who's certified um, to remediate the reading issue. If it's an ADHD, possibly working with an executive functioning coach, um, the family has to consider medication. That's a very personal decision. That's a, you know, a family decision um, or possibly cognitive behavioral therapy. So just very pragmatically, if the school's not gonna do anything, then you have to pursue private means. And sometimes some of those services are covered by insurance and some of them are not. And I would advise people to certainly check with your health insurance provider to see what's covered for you. Um, the, the issue about the, the two year behind, uh, we have a comment here that it's the two years behind is a, a fallacy. Um, if a student's in the 25th percentile one year, and then three years later, they're still in the 25th percentile, did they make progress? So sorry, the question is, if they're still at the 25th percentile? Yes. I mean, the 25th percentile is still considered the average range. So that's considered average. And so a child who's in the 25th percentile, and then let's say three years later is still the 25th percentile, if I'm remembering and understanding correctly, they did make progress because they, they maintained their curve, so to speak, but they didn't close the gap. That's exactly knowledge. right. So okay. at seven, at the 25th percentile, they were performing at the 25th percentile compared to other seven-year-olds. Now at 10 years old, three years later, they're not still performing at the seven-year-old level, but they're performing at the 10-year-old level at the 25th percentile. Excellent, thank you for that clarification. Um, I do see your trauma question, Jenna. I'm gonna come back to it, I'm not skipping you. Um, our SEPTA population does consist of a lot of parents of kids who are twice exceptional. Uh, would you talk a little bit about how your evaluations would include looking for twice exceptionality? Sure. Um, so again, I look at the constellation of scores. And so oftentimes kids who have dyslexia um, have really remarkable visual spatial scores, um, can have very strong language abilities, 
there's sometimes a discrepancy between verbal and written expression. So the written expression is weak, but the verbal, the vocabulary, the language skills are so strong. So um, by looking at all sort of all the different points of the constellation, I can determine if something's in the very high range and compare that to something that might be below average. And uh, a question related to trauma. Can you speak to a child whose testing results might be skewed because the child has experienced trauma and so their trauma response is masking their actual abilities? Mm, that's a tough one. Um, we want to take emotional factors into play. So we would be in our family history when I'd be talking to the parents, I'd find out that history of trauma. Can I make a direct correlation between the trauma and the learning? No, but I, I would definitely speak to it. Also, you, you had mentioned that the relationship between the examiner and the examinee is really important. And so, for example, if a child um, gets triggered by something during a test, hopefully the examiner would be aware and noticing behavioral changes in the child. That Absolutely. I mean, I've had kids who freeze, who um, get so anxious, who get mute. Um, so I, I really want to be in the room with them when that's happening. Yeah. Um, why do some schools do assessments based on grade level and then other assessments are based on age? When do you look at grade norms versus age norms? It's a good question. Um, I think it sometimes depends on the evaluator. So almost every test that I give, I can make a choice about whether I want to compare it to grade or I want to compare it to age. Now, in general, I like to compare it to age. Um, I just feel like we're expecting certain things from an 11 year, six month old. Um, there may be times where I have to compare it to grade, maybe if they've repeated a grade. Um, sometimes I'll give both, I'll give grade and age-based norms, but I think it depends on the evaluator. Absolutely so, sorry, um, I would have to agree. Um, let's see, another question. What are your thoughts in general on IQ testing? For example, everyone might say, my child's IQ um, must be much higher than he tests, but yeah. my kid keeps getting the same score. Um, I'm not a fan of IQ. It's so overrated. Um, I'm a bigger fan of grit. That's another talk that I give. You know, Can we get these kids to have a growth mindset and really sort of praise the effort? Um, I never want a parent, much less a child, to get focused on a number of an IQ. IQ is not a singular thing. There's also emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. You could have someone with, let's say, a very strong verbal IQ, 130, but their nonverbal reasoning IQ might be 94. So what does that mean? What is their IQ? So it's more important to analyze the different points than to focus on any specific number. And let's see, um, actually related to that, um, do you find trends in kids IQ testing over time? Like, do they tend to remain the same or do they regress towards the, the mean? Do they towards the mean? Um, if the child is tested at a very early age, like at four, five, six, then usually their IQ score will regress to the mean, which means it'll get lower. Because at age four, five, and six, we're looking at more crystallized knowledge. What color is grass? How many legs does a cow have? And then at age seven, eight, nine, we're looking at more abstract skills that they might not have learned. Um, and so I see regression to the mean when a child is tested very young to a couple of years later. But in general, IQ should be consistent. It should be reliable over time. So usually when IQ scores are given, there's a band that it's given in, let's say the IQ is 94, it'll say a 95 confidence interval. If we were to give this IQ test again, the score would be between 90 and 99. So you'll get sort of a band of mm -hmm. where it would fall. Yeah, that confidence interval there, right? That's right. Um, <laughs> throwing out the lingo there. You might hear it in your reports. Um, 
do you know of any practitioners who specialize in testing kids with complex communication needs where there's a really huge discrepancy between what they know and what they're able to express? This sort um, of ties into the, the question earlier. Yeah, that's where I would probably go to Children's Hospital, Kennedy Krieger or the Keller Center. Mm -hmm. um, because then we're looking sort of almost more at a medical diagnosis and that if the discrepancy is so severe, then um, someone who's an expert in that area and maybe also a multi-team approach would mm -hmm. be important. Mm -hmm. Probably working with, um, for example, like neuropsych and an occupational therapist and a speech therapist right. and kind of getting lots of eyes on, on the kiddo. Um, a couple more questions for you. Let's see. Students with reading disabilities um, may need to handwrite letters and words in terms of building neural pathways in their brains. How do you reconcile that with using keyboarding as an accommodation? Depends on if the child has a visual motor issue. Yeah. If they have a visual motor issue where the actual motor, visual perception to motor response is short circuited, it, it's not gonna help them to handwrite. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm a big fan of handwriting and taking notes by hand, but it depends on that child's specific profile. Absolutely so. I think <laughs> speaking from experience, it also depends on if the child can read back their writing. Right, right. <laughs> As they get older, if they can't read back their writing, you don't want them taking notes <laughs> with handwriting. That's I'm right, and, and whether it's keyboarding or also um, you know, dictating. So I'm not saying dictating is right for everyone, because again, that, that act of writing is a very powerful tool. I completely agree with that, but not for every student. Yep. Um, speaking then of kids as they get older, um, when they're maybe in middle school or early high school, um, what assessments or indicators would you use to help families make decisions as to whether or not college is the right fit for their student? Yeah, I mean, the thing with college, it, it's about workload and time management. So I actually have a freshman in college right now. And when I ask her, you know, what's the difference between high school and college? She'll just say, you know, they're asking me to read a whole book in three days. Um, they've assigned 300 pages of reading. So it's really about load and volume and organize executive functioning. Executive functioning. Executive functioning is key. You know, planning, yes. um, time management. So those are the discussions you'd want to have with that student, and figure out you know what ways they can sort of up that game, the executive functioning. I, I will share a personal anecdote on this: is that I have a child who had a lot of executive functioning trouble. Grades were so much lower in high school because he was constantly missing turning in assignments. I was very apprehensive about him going off to college where he's studying computer science. And lo and behold, he's doing really well with all this executive functioning stuff. And so I said to him, what's, what's the difference? And he said, I'm, I'm interested in my classes. Yes. And I'm and really motivated that. to get the work done because I'm interested in it. And that relates back to the, the whole attention piece too. They're more so, invested. Yeah, so it's not that the executive functioning skills suddenly magically improved, but the intrinsic motivation improved, which makes a huge difference for some kids. Um, let's see. Can you offer any suggestions, um, given that we are in a virtual setting? So I'm trying to translate this question. Bear with me for a moment here. Uh, seeing teachers. I'm not sure that I'm fully understanding the question. I apologize. Um, I think that it is about um, the difference between face-to-face -face versus virtual and how much being able to see one another and connect with one another makes a difference. Um, I'm sorry if I'm not yeah, I mean, it, I think it makes a huge difference. I mean, some kids are better adept at, at the virtual learning than others. 
Um, some kids actually thrive in the virtual learning. They feel less self-conscious, um, but there are other kids who definitely need the person-to-person -person contact, that immediate feedback, which I think is missing in the virtual learning. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I know I, I sound like a broken record when I keep saying it depends on the student, but yeah, that's what you'd wanna assess. Absolutely, depends on the student. Um, let me see, Amanda, do you have any other questions that have come in from other places where we're sending One, this One, just a second. Okay. While you're looking, I can share a quick anecdote. When you were talking about the testing for ADHD that you do with the, the tests where kids have to either click on something or inhibit and yeah. not click on something. When one of my kids was being assessed, I was describing the test to him and I said, well, the technical term for this is a go, no go test, <laughs> right? You either do it or you yeah. don't, right? And so my, my kid said, well, mom, I went. <laughs> Oh, yeah, well, ADHD. <laughs> there you go. I went. <laughs> Amanda, do you have a, a question there for us? One just came into you. I think you should see. Okay. Bear with me for just a moment here. Um, oh, okay. So this, this has to relate again with that motivational piece. Um, and I don't think it's necessarily as much on the assessment end. Um, how do you respond to a teacher when you tell the teacher that the, your child's negative behaviors that they're seeing are because the child is bored? Um, and sometimes the teacher will respond, well, the child needs to learn how to do things they don't like. So how do you balance that out with the whole um, internal intrinsic motivation piece? Yeah, I mean, that's tough. And that's why some people excel in college as opposed to grade school, high school, because now they're doing something they actually enjoy. Um, I will tell parents, though, that children do need to learn how to produce work despite something being boring or tedious. It's just, it's just what you have to do. Can you say that one more time so I can record it and play it for my <laughs> child? Because I had that conversation today. <laughs> yeah, I mean, kids have to, there's just some stuff you have to do despite being bored or something being tedious, just like adults. You know, there now, are things in our jobs and our daily lives and our family lives that we don't want to do because it's, it's boring or it's uninteresting, um, but we have to do it. So but there's also a difference, though, when a child is bored because the work is too easy. Absolutely. And that's where you just want to really hope that the teacher will work with them on, um, you know, will they give them extra work? Will there be um, other areas of enrichment? Or you'll have to do that at home. Got it. Any other questions, Amanda, that have come in from anywhere else? I think I got through everything that was on our our no, chat stream. I think we're good. Excellent, wonderful. Um, just double checking where I was also taking some notes. No, I think we got them all. So thank you so much. I did find your bio and, and put it into the chat. <laughs> Better late than never. Um, but thank you so very much again for joining us this evening. Um, it was really a wonderfully thorough assessment. Um, Ironically, I had a, a friend from Baltimore who's in the field say, do you know somebody in Virginia who does assessments? And I said, I've got a webinar for you for tonight. So oh, good, 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 perfectly good. timely. Thank you. Um, and no, thank uh, you so much. I enjoy talking about it. We really appreciate it. So thank you to everybody for jumping in and joining us. If you're not a SEPTA member, please join SEPTA. And we are delighted that you were able to come in this evening. So thanks very much. Have a good night and be well. Take care. Michelle, you will need to stop the live stream. Will you talk me through that or on here?